Welcome back, everybody, to Getting Past the Premium. Have a fantastic episode today with Steve Atkinson with Buckingham Strategic Partners. And today we're going to go through with Steve his experience in the industry around going from, or seeing the industry go from that salesperson model to more of an advisory model in the financial services side. So we're, we're excited for this first part of a two part series with Steve. So enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Getting Past the Premium Podcast. Sweet. Welcome, everybody. Yeah. Steve. Yeah, thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah. Good to see you. It's been a while. Been a while. (laughs) It's been a little while for everybody with this uh, pandemic. That's right. To see somebody in person. I know. That's true. So true. Yep. Well, we, yeah, like we appreciate you coming on and uh, we're looking forward to diving in today on just your expertise and experience coming from, as Elliot said in the intro, that uh, more product driven industry in the financial services space to today uh, in certain areas, a very progressive, you know, advisor based model. So Mm -hmm. I guess with that, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of jump in a little bit, tell us about your background and uh, how you got to where you're at today at Buckingham Strategic Partners and go from there. Who is Steve? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's going to be more experience and expertise in this <laughs> commentary. The, uh, I don't know if I'm an expert in anything, but uh, yeah, I was fortunate enough to get in the industry in 1996. Uh, I was just telling someone the other day, I think I, I was getting married and I graduated college and I got my first job in this industry in the same week. Wow. So it happened quick. So yeah. that was 25 years ago. A lot of um, but yeah, getting in the industry in 1996, it was right in the middle of a, uh, of a huge trans- transformation about to happen. And you really... If you really go back in history, you know, a lot of this industry changed in the late 1970s. Uh, a lot of it, I think, was driven by the um, attitudes of the baby boomers, which ultimately got the 401k act passed in, in 1970. It's not called that, but that's from the 401k, which ultimately shifted the burden for most people's retirement from the employer to the employee. Right now, it's, we yeah. have to decide how we're going to invest and secure our retirement. Yeah. Be Before pensions. that, they had nice pensions. Right, yeah. right, right. It was a defined benefit, now it's defined contribution. Right. And you can define how much you contribute, yeah. but we don't know the benefit <laughs> at the end, right? Yeah. But the nice pensions, we kind of knew what was going to happen at the end. So, you know, you shift that burden and all of a sudden, uh, in investors, they needed people to help them invest, right? Make their own decisions. Yeah. Um, so that was a huge boom in the 80s. Um, and most people invested by buying or being sold, you know, mutual funds or products that were offered by one company typically, right? And then in the 1990s, um, with the advent in tech technology, uh, firms like Charles Schwab and stuff put all these products on one platform, right? Now you have this huge supermarket and, and now you got thousands of options. You weren't just buying products from one company. You had this platform was like, oh my God, all these options, what do I do, right? So you saw this um, you know, progression into how do you help people decipher which products, which mutual funds, which investments should make up their portfolio. And it kind of went from this, you know, you know, I would call it a product sales commission process to mm-hmm. how do I give somebody advice and, and be more of an, adv- an investment advisor. So I, coming in 1986, was right in the middle of all that. So out of the gate, you know, I was helping advisors make the mental shift to, um, you know, maybe they earned a commission a couple of years ago. Now, how do I charge a fee to help the clients assess everything out there wow. and overcoming that hurdle? So that was in 96. So, I mean, there was a lot of stock still being traded by brokers back then. Too, Absolutely. Right. I mean, that was the kind of the main uh the way three. financial advice was delivered or like where on the spectrum of advice that was being given for a fee and stockbrokers and then the Schwab TD, like where was the majority of the advice coming from? And well, the majority was all commission. I mean, there was very little fee. Right. You know, it, that was a very novel concept in the, in the, in the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it was a model that started in the late eighties, right? I mean, really, you know, there were, there were people that did it. But there was a giant um, trepidation to actually make that leap, right? Uh, totally different model, different conversation altogether, mm-hmm. right? You know, um, you know, and you could earn you know, back the eight percent to sell a mutual fund, and when I got a ninety six, there's something like four and a half percent. But it's like, wait, one percent? That's a different. That's a it's a big pay cut, 
even though you get paid every year, right? But you're going to you have to retain that fee on advice versus you sell a product, you get paid. Um, but it definitely changed the dynamic of the advisor client relationship uh, in a positive way, I think. I mean, you ask a client, they'd rather be able to talk to you without the fear of being sold something. Just have a real conversation yeah. of whether or not we can help me. And maybe sometimes to do nothing is the right thing to do. That's and a we, good point. Yeah, and we talk about that a lot, relating it to other aspects of the risk management industry and other sides of, of the industry is that we're, say, PNC insurance, you're in a commission-based product environment, which is what you're talking about in the 90s. Yeah. You know, we were in, but it, you saw that transition to where we're at today. And I don't know if we had Big Al could, could pull up some statistics here of, how much of the industry is actually fee-based, mm -hmm. you know, and is actually getting paid for their advice versus for the product. Mm -hmm. And I think we talk about that a lot, that where are we at in this shift? And yeah. nobody knows quite yet where we're seeing a lot more people on the PNC side talk about it or talk about being an advisor, but rarely are we seeing true meat behind it with actually going to a fee or mm -hmm. actually pulling out commission. How much of the industry is fee-based versus commission-based pro products on the financial services side? Um, so my question maybe for you is like, as you saw that transition, like how long did that take and like what was the impetus to get from those commission products to true, where you saw that we actually saw the shift in the industry? Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still ongoing, right? There are, yeah, still, there are still some people that haven't fully adopted it or um, for a variety of reasons, right? right. Um, Many. You know, money drives decisions, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And when there's a, um, a big pool sitting somewhere, it's, uh, even though maybe the right model in your own mind is to go to a, an advisory-based model, you know, it's kind of hard to give up that. But uh, they'll all come around at some point. I mean, I'm a, I'm a believer that all these products are commodities. You know, and uh, yeah, as an advisor, you, you, you got to realize you're in the people business and in relationship business, and all these products are in, in, are all commodities. And the, I think the, the advisor of the future is going to be the one that really understands people. Mm -hmm. And really gets them to talk about really what's driving them every single day, because there's probably you know numerous products that solve problems for clients, but what I still see today is most advisors are engaging with their clients on a very linear basis. Right, they do one or two, maybe three things for them, but the reality is they could probably be helping their clients maybe twenty things. Yeah, but they focus on a couple of things. The clients focus on a couple of things because that's what they they bought. Uh, but a great advisor is truly comprehensive and um, spending a lot of time uncovering all the needs and then bringing in other experts. But yeah, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's an ongoing battle, but it's a heck of a lot more today doing fee-based and advisory-based than it was 25 yeah, years ago. For sure. It's a monumental shift. How, how did you, one of the things that we talk quite a bit about uh, on, on this podcast is if you're sitting there as a product driven agent today in the risk management space you know like what clicks in your mind to start to move to more of an advisory based model yeah so i guess i'm curious back in 96 when you were getting into the industry and you were looking around i mean how did you know that that was going to be the future of the financial services industry yeah versus you know going to work for a stockbroker and thinking that was that the, that was the deal. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot to that question, and, and let me start by saying, you know, I don't want to demonize anybody that is product, totally. right? Because I don't think people intentionally go in and say, "I'm going to sell product," and uh, I, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it. All right? Yeah. I, I think yeah. people, I honestly believe that most advisors or whatever you want to call them, they're doing what they think is the right thing, Correct. but they only know what they know, right? Absolutely. And they don't know what they don't know. And we talk a lot that advisors need product people, you know, like there, there, ha there still has to be people out there like life insurance, for example, as a product is a really good tool. Somebody has to transact it, has to make sure it's set up correctly, so on and so forth. Yeah, but even that, you know, again, I, I would change it a little bit and say, you know, they need products. I don't know if we need product people, because even if I'm going to engage with another professional to get a product. I want that to be a relationship-based relationship, not a. I don't want them to just. I don't. Be, I don't want them to be a vendor, right? Because if that I bring sense. up something, I want them to be honest enough with me to say, "Hey, Steve, you asked for this, but I actually need why, based on your situation or your client situation, mm -hmm. right?" Whereas when I think of you know product 
salespeople. You know, it's like I go to the store and I want to buy toothpaste. I say, give me the Crest. They're going to give me the Crest. I go, hey, you should actually buy Colgate, right? <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, a product person is just transacts with you. That's what they do. Yeah. I don't think most advisors, even if we call them product people and they're still kind of operating in that realm, I don't think they view themselves that way is where I'm getting at here. Right. But they also maybe don't know what else is out there or they don't know how to get to where they want to get to, right? There's a lot of the ch challenges between our own ears. But going back to your point of, you know, in the 1990s, uh, when I first got into this industry, what made me think it was the future? I, I, I had no idea. Right? <laughs> but I knew what I knew what resonated with me. Yeah. So, I, I mean, my entire life, I knew I would never want to get into sales, right? The idea, and I define sales as someone's not ready for something and I got to make sure they get it. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. that's how I get paid. Mm -hmm. I view sales like it's a way for me to get paid. Right. Whereas there's so many people out there that need help that if I can just project, here's how I can help people, they will actually show up or they get referred into you. Okay. To me, that's not selling. It's like I can, I'm here to help people. I know how I help oh. people and I project that out and they show up. Um, so early on, I just, maybe I was stubborn, but my first um, job is I moved, I moved to Connecticut and I was in you know New York City and Boston and these cities. And I kept asking myself, you know, I know I'm in a sales role, but I'm going to do it differently. I kept <laughs> saying, why would anyone up in like on Wall Street buy something from somebody from Omaha? Like they have hundreds of people. Why wouldn't they? Hundreds of, <laughs> hundreds of other firms to buy here. Why would they buy something from someone in Omaha? Uh, but I kept saying, you know, is um, the only way I can be different is on advice and how I engage with them from a relationship standpoint and be a resource. And fortunately, that worked. And I think it works all the time. People react better to people yeah. than the products you represent. Let's say this does say 31% of people in a poll in 2017 didn't know if they were paying investment account fees or unsure what they pay. Well, so a third of people, yeah. That's scary. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and you know, I think the way that you articulated that is is kind of, I think, the same way that we talk about it a lot on this podcast in that, you know, by nature, say again, using the PNC sites, it's kind of black and white. Those products are mostly commission-based products, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So in order for you to get paid as, uh, as an advisor, a salesperson, whatever the term is, producer, um, you know, you have to sell that product. But I think the majority of the industry, I do think, has the right interests of the client at heart, is trying to make sure that they don't have an uncovered claim, um, you know, and is truly doing the right thing. Now, there's certainly there's people out there that are just trying to push as much product as they can to sure. increase premium, you know, and drive commission. But ultimately, I do think, and that's what we talk about being an advisor. I think it's those people that really want to help their client manage risk, ultimately get the right product in the right place. And sometimes when you do that, you get paid less actually mm -hmm. in that mop. Sure. Because yeah. you decrease premium, right? And so that's where we talk a lot about, you know, if you go to more of that fee base or you truly lean into it to that next degree, you can align yourself correctly with the client. But I think to your point, you can be that advisor even in a product based model. It's just having the right mentality. I think right? you're spot on. I mean, I, I'll give you a personal story. So, um, you know, I, ha I, I buy my home and auto and, you know, insurance through a certain person and um, with a big name, I won't mention on this podcast, <laughs> right? But he, he's not the only person I've ever worked with. And uh, the, the person I had before, my wife and I said, hey, let's schedule time with our agent. I want to do a full insurance review to make sure we're not missing anything. So he agreed to take our, you know, we were already clients, right? Because mm -hmm. we, he sold us the policies that we had. Um, and we just bought another house and we had, you know, a boat now and, and I didn't know what to do, right? I, so I wanted to do an insurance review. And we sat down and I, I assumed like he had a process to do an insurance review. And it was an awkward <laughs> first five or 10 minutes because he's asking me, well, what do you want to talk about? And I'm like, well, no, your question asked me. Yeah. <laughs> so I really, we realized very quickly that this isn't the person we want to be buying insurance from because if we have to identify all of our risks and our gaps, and if we don't bring something up, now we're exposed. This isn't the person we want to work with. Uh -huh. So we ended up finding somebody who actually knew how to ask questions. And again, at the end of the day, it's just you got to be able to relate to people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're in the people business. You may sell products, but there are people across the desk. So when we did, we found this other advisor. We asked, um, and we want to do an insurance review. He goes, okay. Then he had a bunch of questions. Okay, you have a second house. Oh, do you have a boat there? Yes. Oh, do you have an ATV also? Yeah, we do have an ATV. Oh, you're going to need to have that insurance too because <laughs> kids are going to be riding the ATV. Yeah. Holy cow. I mean, he uncovered things that we didn't bring to him that uh, we never would have seen. So 
but it, I think that's just normal course of being in, you know, in a relationship. Yeah. You, you be, you're curious, you're inquisitive because you want to see if you can help them and bring your expertise to their life. Yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, I agree. It's spot on. And, and I think that what we talk about a lot on the podcast is then how do we do that? Right. And I think you've probably seen over the last 25 years, a lot of different ways to do that strategies or systems or whatnot. So, um, you know, what have you found to be the most effective, you know, going, somebody going from having that product mentality of, of the selling the broker based uh, model to more of that, whether it's fee based or just truly becoming the advisor to a client, no matter how they're compensated, yeah. you know, how do you see, or what do you see work in that shift? As far as the advisor making that shift to have more of an advisory based, um, mm -hmm. you know, one, one, uh, they realize that they're never going to lose the knowledge they have of the products they sold. Right. So it isn't like you're going from one to another. Yeah. You kind of, you get to retain everything you have yeah, totally, and you can uh, evolve and, and add more to your client relationship. Point. Yeah, great point. So I think, again, that's one of those things between our own ears. Like this isn't, you know, I, I, here's an analogy I tell a lot of people. I go, you know, 20 years ago when you turned on your computer, right? What, what was the operating system? Actually, 20 years ago. Well, maybe longer. Oh, yeah. 25. 25. <laughs> <laughs> when did Windows 95 come out? <laughs> Pre-Windows 95. Yeah. What, what, would you, what was your computer running on? Uh, DOS based DOS, system. Yeah. DOS, right. Now, how many can tell me who's running on DOS today? No, because something better came about, yeah. right? So you would never run on DOS, even though DOS worked absolutely fine at the time. But then you saw Windows 95, you're like, holy cow, this is so much better. Well, the advisory model is so much better, right? So, it, but it, but it, take all, it took all the basic premise and working premise of DOS and then made it a better experience for the user. Right. It was it's an evolution. Yeah. So I think with the advisors realizing it confidence that this isn't a change of stripes. It's an evolution and they can do better for their client. That's what works. But there is different language. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, what I, my experience has been, you know, when you're selling product, you know, usually you can't know every product out there. So you get very comfortable with a handful of companies. Yep. Probably the same thing in the insurance industry. But and you learn their story. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I remember uh, I was sold. um a Hartford, uh, can we mention company names on here? Yeah. But a Hartford policy once, and we're very loose with the rules. You can do whatever you want. You'll, you'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my compliance won't let me say this. <laughs> but uh, uh, they should be like you know how they they gave me like a um, nice replica of an insurance they had for Babe Ruth, and then and I'm like these are really cool. So you learn their story. Yeah. We insured Babe Ruth, and we insured like maybe Abraham Lincoln, and all this kind of stuff. Like holy <laughs> smokes. That's where I want to get my insurance to. They've been through around forever, right? So I think as a you know, you 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 focus a lot on the story of the product so that people go, I want that. I want to relate to that. An advisor has a different paradigm. They focus on the client first and they get to know them. And then all the products are get selected based on that person. So yeah. it, it, it's malleable to the client versus the client being malleable to the product. It's a great way to look at it. Hmm. Did they actually insure Abraham Lincoln? They insured somebody <laughs> like that. <laughs> it would have yeah. been a few years ago. Yeah, it would have been just a couple. Yeah. 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 So you, you know, you talked a lot about <clears throat> somebody's mindset and how they can kind of control their own destiny or you feel like they might be able to, you know, change the way that they think about how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you and feel free to, you know, stay, stay in your industry, but if you're somebody who's sitting in that type of situation today, like we talked about, I mean, the people who are in that situation, they, they might know that they might not know, but they might know that there's a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to get there because yeah. they're wrapped up in the corporate machine or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you have for advice or you know, just kind of words of wisdom for people who are sitting there today and they're just, they have no idea how to make that transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing magical. I mean, get help. I mean, yeah. ask for help. Um, you know, a um, couple things, you know, by the way, it's not just uh, orange tree. You remember Blockbuster video? Yeah. If you don't know that story yet. But that's yeah. a transaction. You went there, you know, you're going to get the movie and you get disappointed as soon as you get there because it's out. 
right? Yeah. And then uh, if you do rent it, you bring it back late, it's five dollars more. And <laughs> if you get to rewind the tape back Such to the VHS, a it was a bad experience, right? But it was the experience at the time. Uh, all Actually, we knew. Let's go out. I mean, it was a deal. You go out to Blockbuster, right? Yeah. And we're all going to run around and you know vote on what movie we're going to get. I still remember how the store smell. You know, That's like you weird. the popcorn and the movies. You spent that it much was time in a Blockbuster. <laughs> No, <laughs> but, but it's so much more enjoyable now to go to Netflix and go, oh, look at all these things, right? I don't have to rewind anything. Um, but, you know, you know, a blockbuster kicked and screamed, right? Didn't adapt and adapt and yeah. now they're gone, right? So that's going to, ha- you know, my viewpoint is at some point that's going to happen. So people that are hesitant, ask for help. I mean, you're not the first mover. Right, so you're not the you're not the early yeah. adopter at this point. Right. People have done it, following other people's footsteps, and um, and if and if you really want to know, ask your clients how what feels better to them. Mm. And that's a good point. My guess is most clients would say, I would rather engage where I don't feel like I have to buy something at the end of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting that analogy too. Thinking about the. Broker compensation, like you mentioned, some you know initially it looks like it's a hit to your compensation. Well, using that blockbuster Netflix analogy, we probably all, assuming we all probably have Netflix in this room, pay more to have Netflix than we otherwise would have to go rent movies at Blockbuster. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, and because it's that much better of an experience, yeah. and it's at your fingertips, it's on your couch, everything that we all want, and yeah. we pay more for it. Yeah, and I think it's the same thing on you know advisor versus versus yeah. product or. If, as we've been discussing it, that people are a lot of times willing to pay more for that better experience yeah. um, or even just buy more products from you because now they understand it better. They feel better about it. They feel mm-hmm. like you've got their back. You understand them. So your recommendation carries more weight, you know, yeah. even if it is in that product space. Yeah. And so it doesn't always have to be that linear, you know, I'm going to go backwards or I'm going to yeah. go to this model and make less. Or well, well and the, the other big point we've really touched on is uh, as a business owner, Right. So, yes, you'll make less maybe today on that one client, but we're talking about risk management here. Right. Mm-hmm. We're talking about financial services and we're talking about people's lives, which mm-hmm. you were building plans and we're protecting things well out into the future. Mm-hmm. Right. In some cases, 20, 30 years in the future. Now, your client today is relying on your advice to work for the next 20 or 30 years, which they which means you need to be in business the next 20 or 30 years to see it through. Yeah. Right. So. Yes, you um, you know you maybe make less this year from that client going to an advisory based model, mm-hmm. but it gives you predictable cash flow for your business mm-hmm. because every year you've got revenue coming in, which means your business is more likely to stay afloat and not ebb and flow with sales transactions and the the markets and everything else. So you're actually protecting your business, which ultimately protects all the client plans that you put in place, which are relying on the on the future. Yeah, totally. And is probably at the end of the day a more valuable asset for the for the business owner. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Sure, higher recurring predictable revenue. Yeah, you know, we talked about that on the last one with Erica Moorhead. Of it is an asset to the business owner. Yeah, you know, and so we whether you're looking at your client or your business, it's you want to protect that asset either way. And being the best advisor is the way to do that. Yeah, I think it's just uh, common. You know, in a way, it's common sense. uh, prudence, or uh, if you're really going to have fiduciary responsibility, you better make sure you're in business, yeah. right? Yeah. Otherwise, you're. you're I've never thought about that, but it's kind of an important piece of it. <laughs> Other than just saying to the yeah. client, "Hey, you know what? Here's the plan. Hopefully, I'm hopefully I'm around. Yeah. You know, if I'm not, good luck. <laughs> yeah, you should uh, make sure you're around. We do battle a lot of conversations though with risk advisors around, you know, making the mental switch that because it is when you when you when you move from a transactional based model to an advisory based model mm-hmm. there is a lag in time sure right yeah. like they're just Cash flow wise, yes and and or even the prospecting process and if somebody's concerned about their sales numbers on the insurance side and you know whatnot like it it's different even uh when i was at td ameritrade i mean i i was there while they made the shift Mm -hmm. from being fairly product driven to giving us uh, goal planning software to walk through with a client and everyone's concern was how that was going to lengthen the sales cycle right sure of being able to help somebody we talk about that in the risk management industry and it's even more dramatic 
because some of the tools and, you know, we are kind of in uncharted territory from that advisory perspective. So, um, yeah, it's, there's, there's definitely hesitancy with risk advisors going from this model that they know, even though it's probably more unstable than it could be if they were to actually make the leap, mm-hmm. then, you know, being comfortable with a sometimes a six, seven, eight, 12, 24 month cycle to build a relationship and have that advisory based model. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, we run into it all the time, and I would imagine maybe you saw some of that over the years on the financial services side as advisors made that transition. I don't know if you can speak to that at all, but no, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the first thing they're evaluating is um, you know obviously they're planning for their clients, and now they're going, no, I got to plan for myself. Yeah. You know, if I if we we've been bringing in this much money and I've got this many employees and this transaction model is generating X to to cover all these costs, how do I make this shift? to um, keep everything afloat, right? Yeah. And, and actually you know, keep a lifestyle in my own family. Um, but you build a business plan around it. You know mm-hmm. I mean? Hopefully we don't spend everything we make. Yeah. That's my best. <laughs> I mean, that was the, that's when I coached a lot of advisors early on that one, they, they knew this was a better model. They go, how do I make it work? Because, but I think often um, at first glance, they simply go from, I'm making this and I'm gonna make a fourth, right? And, and you got to talk about okay. I mean, you're you're a you're a, you're an advisor. You're a planner. All right. How much have you saved? Right. <laughs> like, are you following your own advice yeah. here? Right. You're telling your clients to save and that it have more assets, liabilities, etc. So, fortunately, you know, people I would work with um, were pretty good at that. Right. They, yeah. they they were they were doing their own thing. So they simply just said, yeah, I'm gonna I've got enough reserves to cover this thing because it's a long term business strategy decision. Mm-hmm. Um, every every business owner probably starts off in the hole. But they had high confidence and degree of their business model is going to work long term. Mm-hmm. But if, if the goal is always, uh, and this is where I put it the cap like a salesperson, right? I mean, salespeople, a lot of them, they don't have to have any offices, right? It's almost like a hobby. They got a product, they sell, they make cash, right? Yeah. Like, that's not a business. They, they were at really actually very little risk. Mm-hmm. The clients carry yeah. all the risk there. Totally. Um, but if that's very your mindset, true. you may never make the switch until you're forced to, mm-hmm. right? If commissions ever went away, like that has in the UK and in Australia, if that ever model came here, well, then you have to do it. But I'm the, of the belief of I'd rather do it before I'm forced to. Yeah, yeah, because it's the right thing to do. Right. Well, that's the that's exactly the conversations. Why we started the podcast is let's get ahead of this potential shift in the rest of the risk management industry. Yeah. Um, and be on the forefront of it, and actually drive that shift faster. Because I think if the more advisors that are out there with this type of a model, training clients that, hey, this is the type of advice you should be regularly seeing, Mm -hmm. the more the clients are going to start to demand that and the more the industry shifts. And the better we can do that, it's some of the hardest things we battle, or even clients of ours that we've had over the years that are used to one model. That's sometimes the hardest process to shift because they're used to it. They're kind of going, it's worked pretty well up to this point. You haven't had any issues. Why are we changing it? You know, and um, until we can get people to see that type of model. And, and you're right, let's do it before we're forced to. Yeah. Because then it's, or a bigger threat comes in where an Amazon yeah. or somebody like that starts to sell these products yeah. at half the cost so that we can do it or yeah. lower. Uh, and that's a real threat out there right now on, on the insurance side, most mostly. But, they give you, know. you a discount because they know you just bought new carbon monoxide detectors <laughs> yeah. and fire extinguishers. Right, right. Oh, they know. <laughs> they know everything. Yeah. And, and another thing to think about is, you know, way to, you know, maybe overcome the income hit is expanding services. Yeah. And that's yeah. what you guys do is, right, so if I'm doing insurance only, um, you know, you do if you're doing wealth management for somebody, and obviously, you know, risk management is part of the wealth management equation. So it better be factored into asset management, um, legacy planning, charitable, it better all be in there as one, right? And what you see a lot in our industry is a lot of siloing. Right, the the professionals that are selling the products don't talk to one another, which all that does is put all the burden on the client. Right, mm-hmm. they have to interpret yes. every all the individual advice and make sure that their plan is their plan. They're their own quarterback. Correct. Um, so you know what we've seen is you know firms that used to specialize in a certain area or product, they either partner up with somebody else that, that complements them. So you know our company at Buckingham started off as as much as CPAs. Right, they were doing oh, really? tax. 
tax prep. Um, but what they, you know, obviously every year you'd see, they'd see the tax returns and go, okay, you got all these gains, you, you know, you're paying more in tax than you have to, go tell your advisor to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And they realized that it, it, did, it actually you know, took twice as much time to do the work as someone else had to do it. And then in a lot of cases, it never got done, right? Maybe the client didn't go pass the information along or the other advisor didn't do something. So, you know, we, we've helped a lot of CPA firms add wealth management because they can actually do a much better job for the client on both the tax side and the wealth management side because they, they should be working together with one another. Yeah. And you can do the same thing you know, with the insurance, right? So you know, you're, you'll say your insurance and you're getting paid through the product and commissions. Maybe you broaden your scope of services, right? And mm -hmm. partner up with somebody and now you've diversified your income streams and it's not an immediate hit because you're getting revenues from other, other areas from the client on a, on a total client level. Yeah. Uh, and, but you're actually doing it because you can do a better job for the client. To provide more value. Versus them having to carry the burden, correct? Yeah. That's so true. Yep. Well, it's a well, deep conversation. We could go on for, for days, but I'm getting the signal from Big Al that uh, we're at our time. So um, I think that that leads into, though, some good conversations that we can have in part two of this around this evolution, you know, and how do we continue to see this shift that ultimately we all believe is coming and it's how it would be on the forefront of that as we've been talking. So, um, thanks man. That was good. Yeah, that was great. a good conversation. Yeah. Hope everybody got some good stuff out of it. Thanks Stay for being here. Stay tuned for part two. That sounds good. Thank you.